This is Pulse 95. Pulse 95. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Talking the stories that are shaping headlines, plus those that make you go, hmm. Everybody, good morning and welcome to the Morning Majlis, the show where we talk about stories shaping the headlines. Today is Thursday, July 2nd. We've got the weekend coming up and uh, we have a lot of stories to delve into this morning. Big news out of the country and around the world. Hong Kong's national security law kicking in. That's been all over the headlines. We'll talk about its implications for Hong Kong and the wider relationship between China and China and the Western world. Good morning to you, Rania. Good morning to you, and Ahmed. Abdul Karim. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> Good morning mm. to, to all the morning majlis <laughs> and to all the listeners of the show. Well, one sector uh, in particular that has been really hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic is obviously the tourism sector. And um, it stands to lose up to $3.3 trillion. And that comes after a four-month uh, standstill due to the coronavirus crisis, of course. So we will talk about the, the current state of travel and how countries that depend heavily on tourism will experience dramatic effects in the labor market and also in their national income. And which countries in particular are we going to talk about that are suffering this impact? And what are the four measures that are planned in the near future? Yep, of course, it's going to be a very busy show indeed. And we're going to be talking about uh, the developments here in Sharjah as well as building on the world of tourism how the aviation sector is set to welcome back the Boeing 737 MAX. No announcement has been made yet, still considering, uh, but it is going to be a possibility. And uh, later on in the program, we will be discussing how important job security is. A lot of people have this issue of uh, are concerned. But one person in this planet has now been given an, a, gar- a guarantee to continue his time in office for another 16 years. What's going on? We shall be discussing that later on in the program. Stay tuned to the Morning Majlis. Pulse 95. Between local lines, notes from the Emirate. Yes, notes from the Emirate, notes from Sharjah. And we are talking about the latest virtual meeting that was actually held yesterday morning uh, and chaired by Sheikh Sultan bin Mohammed bin Sultan Al Qasimi, Crown Prince and Deputy Ruler of Sharjah and Chairman of the Sharjah Police Academy. And this meeting was over the meeting of the the Academy and it reviewed the academic efforts made during the past period as a result of the coronavirus and the precautionary and also the proactive measures that were taken as well as the initiatives adopted aiming to preserve the safety of students and also employees while continuing academic, scientific and police work in accordance with the best standards. Yeah, the meeting uh, praised the efforts of the uh, the academy's personnel, which resulted in the continuation of all the tasks required, uh, as they describe, with high efficiency, responsibility and professionalism, despite the exceptional circumstances. And one thing that we should also remember is uh, it, it was a couple of days ago when the police academy became home to 280 uh, unemployed workers uh, who were found in the industrial area in the charge of police uh, and uh, they were at the forefront to offer and extend a helping hand and they were housed in the police academy's facilities so there's so much uh, that they've actually uh, been recognized for as well. Absolutely, they certainly play a major role in the community here in Sharjah, upholding everybody's safety. They also, in the meeting, went over a number of issues uh, that arose during COVID-19, particularly the state of the new batch of undergraduate students for the year. Their admissions were suspended as part of precautionary measures ensuring their safety. They also reviewed the efforts to obtain the world rankings of universities before approving admissions for new batches of postgraduate students at the Sharjah Police Academy. 
Yep, and it was uh, uh, in line with the current precautionary measures. It was a video conference as well, and uh, it, it comes across as a, as a very, very important meeting. And it's been a very busy week uh, with Sharjah Police because uh, they've actually reviewed another training program, which we will be discussing later on today, uh, as uh, we are getting back to normal life and preparing uh, for us uh, to to fight this pandemic uh, together in a very responsible manner as well. Well, so much to look forward to and so much to be discussing uh, right here on the Morning Majlis. Up next, we shall be talking uh, uh, about the aviation sector and the world of business and in terms of how Boeing 737 MAX shall be returning, but with, uh, with further consideration. Stay tuned to The Morning Majlis. The Morning Majlis. Talking the stories that are shaping headlines. This is, this is Pulse 95. This is Pulse 95 and a very good morning on to the program. And uh, it's all about the av- world of aviation, world of travel as well, because there's now been a new list uh, of um, reasons where residents and citizens can travel abroad. You have to apply through a specific program and th- a, a specific uh, on, a, on a website to ask for that permit. But focusing this early on, on the big message that we've seen yesterday, and that was uh, the return of Boeing 737 MAX. About a few months ago, let's say almost uh, just above a year ago, we weren't very pleased. Everyone became an aviation expert against the MCAS system and saying, look, this is a horrible plane, this is this, and this is what needs to go back and we will never fly it. Mm. Confidence is gradually returning, and that's why the General Civil Aviation Authority of the United Arab Emirates is considering the return of the 737 MAX to its airspace after a 15-month grounding of the narrow-body jet. Yes, and this 15-month grounding actually um, happened uh, after 346 people died in two crashes, one on Lion Air Flight 610 that happened on October uh, 29th in 2018, and uh, also another uh, flight, which is Ethiopian Air- Airlines Flight 302 that happened on March 10th of 2019. But now... The UAE's decision on whether to approve the return of the 737 MAX to service is actually dependent on Boeing and the U.S. aviation regulator's current certification activities. And according to Saif al Suedi, the GCAA's director general, he said the GCAA is closely working with the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, Boeing and UAE operators on uh, 737 MAX return to service since its grounding after two tragic accidents. But we are in regular discussions with the FAA and Boeing also on all aspects of their certification, um, including design, test flights, and also training for the flight crew. Yeah, so looking at the situation here, the Boeing 737 MAX was involved in two deadly crashes uh, in late 2018 and early 2019, which led to the grounding of its airplanes all around the world. And there have been reports emerging, a report by the Inspector General, about what happened exactly, what went wrong. And they're saying that there was a a communication error, a massive one uh, that prevented the finding or the uh, the accountability and responsibility for Boeing to take for its faulty systems. Uh, They're saying Boeing shielded from federal regulators reviewing the aircraft, the extent and capability of the flawed computer system. They also spoke about issues when it came to the Federal Aviation Administration, which is the United States' uh, governing body regulating air, uh, air travel in the States. Uh, they said that the Federal Aviation Administration communicated poorly and handed over the majority, 87% of certification responsibility to Boeing itself, causing a bit of a conflict of interest. However, the latest set of tests have been notably rigorous. Uh, This week, they had three days of testing. Typically, these tests take a couple of hours in one day, but uh, Federal Aviation Administration pilots and engineers took their time to evaluate Boeing's proposed changes, and they have now completed the required recertification flight tests, which takes the 737 MAX a big step closer 
to FAA approval to return to service. Yes, a number of uh, things must be accomplished before the plane can receive clearance, but this is a major milestone. Certainly is, uh, and it's going to take some time in terms of get, getting that public trust. Yes, they're going to get mm. the certification. Yes, they're going to get uh, the approvals from the civil aviation. But if someone were to tell you saying, hey, you're going to be boarding that plane, and you'll always be thinking, um, can I just look for another option on my sky, sky scanner? Does, because sky scanner and these applications yeah. actually tell you which they aircraft tell you. it is. They tell you, they tell you, yep. And you... It's going to be so interesting to see how people will react. Yes, and it's good that the the Boeing and the regulators are going to have a little bit more of a um, hardline approach, let's say, to check it out. But uh, it could be it could be very interesting to see what happens. You know, I would trust mm. it if you would if you were to ask mm-hmm. me. I would trust to to board on it once again because if you think about it, if you as a person today mm-hmm. you go and you get into a car accident, right? right? And then after that, you take one of these two decisions. Either you stop driving because you're in shock and you're scared to get into a, this fatal mm-hmm. accident or mm-hmm. bad accident again, or you enhance your driving skills and you become more aware mm-hmm. and you get up, you get up, let's just say stronger than, than before, yeah. right? So this is my, my theory on this. Mm-hmm. They're going to enhance as much as they can their, um, let's just say, uh, their services, their plane, uh, what they have to offer is going to be much more probably than the other planes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So well, that's just my theory on this. Well, Boeing has a lot of work to do as far as gaining the public's trust back. When you have these damning reports emerge that Boeing presented limited information to the governing authorities and that the Federal Aviation Administration handed over the majority of oversight to mm-hmm. Boeing itself, which is motivated by its profits and competition with Airbus, mm-hmm. that really erodes the public's trust, not just in Boeing, but also aviation administrations and certain governmental bodies that are in charge of regulating this particular issue as well. Now, the Federal Aviation Administration responded saying that, look, with the tests we are conducting now are unlike anything we've done before. We are ensuring that the MCAS, which has been blamed for the crashes, Mm -hmm. uh, cannot be triggered by a single sensor and cannot be activated repeatedly. Uh, Boeing also stated that they revamped the entire architecture of the flight control software Mm. so that the jets systems now use both flight control computers on each flight instead of one so they're using two sensors on each side of the plane instead of one and uh, as far as the tests are concerned uh, the the plane flew for two hours this Monday four hours on Tuesday and an hour and 37 minutes yesterday and they said there were no faults whatsoever yeah, and one of the reasons why it is quite uh, in- interesting to see is uh, because um, we have a number of a number of orders were made from uh, regional carriers, Air Arabia, um, but Fly Dubai as well, and uh, Saudi Arabia's Fly Deal, also uh, another massive uh, company, uh, looking at uh, purchasing these uh, planes. Almost 400 orders for the Boeing 737 Max went on hold after that news broke um so it's going to be very interesting to see how things pan out eventually but uh it's it's going to take some time but the united arab emirates has said that they'll be following uh, the guidelines and uh, also the the reports of the federal aviation authority in the united states of america for now the team at morning majlis is uh, appearing slightly sad is because there is a, a, a new way and a new method of booking holidays now so you can't be booking a holidays or flying out anytime soon you need a very very valid reason to do so and we shall be discussing that later on in the program so stay tuned this is the morning majlis only on pulse 95 the morning majlis talking the stories that are shaping headlines This is is Pulse95. Hi, everybody. Good morning and welcome back to the Morning Majlis, talking the stories, shaping the headlines. And we're looking at the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on global tourism. And according to a United Nations report, the global tourism sector stands to lose up to $3.3 trillion. That's 12 trillion dirhams as the COVID-19 pandemic cripples international travel. Yes, in the most optimistic scenario, of course, international tourism could lose $1.2 trillion or 
That's about 1.5% of global uh, gross domestic uh, product or GDP after, of course, a four-month standstill due to the coronavirus crisis. And that is according to the United Nations Conference uh, on Trade and Development that was held yesterday. Now, it also examined the economic impact of the halt in tourism in general through three scenarios, depending on the duration of the global restriction on travel, um, to quantify the effects on, on countries' incomes and also trade and employment. Now, the sector could suffer a $2.2 trillion reduction as a result of an eight-month standstill in international travel. And the worst case scenario here is it points to a dramatic $3.3 trillion loss, as I said, from a 12-month pause, which is more than double the size of the international tourism industry. Yeah, they, based on these stats and analysis, they say the tourism industry is one of the industries or main industries that have been uh, have been bearing the brunt of uh, the trouble and the damage unleashed by the restrictions to contain the coronavirus and that's because of the travel restrictions a lot of jobs have been lost a lot of cabin crew uh, have uh, sadly made redundant a number of huge airlines across the globe and uh, the the airlines in america as well they're saying that they've been overstaffed Uh, that is another uh, bit of uh, an indication in terms of how countries are now looking at that aspect as well in terms of what the airlines will be and how they will be able to cope iat has spoken out about the potential losses and uh, the tourism industry is going to face uh, a bit of a a downslide Um, among the worst hit countries by this is uh, countries like Jamaica. Uh, 20% of their GDP comes from tourism. Another country is Thailand, followed by Croatia, Portugal and Dominican Republic, who have all recorded losses of 9%, 8% and 6% respectively. In this region, we've had uh, we've had another major major country, Egypt, as well, that uh, relied uh, heavily on tourism. Absolutely, and uh, this UN report definitely addresses the fact that Egypt could lose more than three percent of its GDP following the collapse of tourism around the world. Uh, now, it isn't just countries like uh, or, or countries that are tourism hotspots that are reeling from this. There are wealthier nations as well with more diversified economies like France, like Greece, like the United States. The report says these nations could also stand to lose billions of dollars in tourism revenue as a result of uh, the collapse of tourism amid the coronavirus. Yep, of course. And uh, we are seeing a a return to the world of tourism as well. And uh, we're seeing that 50% of activities have been returned or reopened uh, in, in the United Arab Emirates, in Sharjah in particular, uh, and Sharjah Tourism is also looking at adding more hospitality and tourism sites, as well as sustainable tourism as another aspect. And here, based on uh, the new requirements and an exit uh, approval that is required through the Federal Authority of Identity and Citizenship, it just goes to show that a lot of people will be looking at uh, staycations uh, here in in this country. So if you're one of those looking and exploring an option of booking uh, one of those staycation deals, let us know on the text lines 4215. Our very own Urania was one among uh, those staycationers and uh, has prefer- and preferred to stay in the country for a while. I did, yeah. but my advice... Wear sunscreen, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you need to catch our live broadcast on our YouTube channel and Pulse 95 Wear sunscreen. Radio. I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I got sunburned. Well, it happens. Well, there's going to be so much to look, to look forward to because it is certainly summer vibes here in the studios as well as in the country. Uh, up next, we shall be talking about the another hot spot for the world of aviation. It is Hong Kong. And there is a massive question mark that has appeared. Still Stay tuned to The Morning Majlis. The Morning Majlis, talking the stories that are shaping headlines 
This is Pulse 95. This is Pulse 95 and a very good morning. Welcome back onto the program. Um, focusing our or shifting our focus now on Hong Kong. So much has been going on, lots of developments overnight as well. Uh, we're looking at situations such as uh, the arrests being made and the new national security law. Experts say that it is uh, worrying because it's given Beijing extensive powers it has never had before to shape life in the territory far beyond the legal system. Uh, it is the Article 29 uh, of the um, uh, of the uh, the law which is, says that anyone who conspires with foreigners to provoke hatred of the Chinese government or the authorities in Hong Kong could have committed a criminal offence. And that's what people are saying. Broad wording is one aspect of the uh, the new security law. Uh, Baranya, lots of arrests were made, weren't they? Yes, a lot of arrests. Hong Kong police have made their first arrests under a new anti-protest law imposed by Beijing as crowds marked 23 years since the end of British rule. Now, 10 people were held accused of violating the law, including a man with a pro-independence flag. About 360 others were also detained at a banned rally. Now, the national security law targets uh, a subversion and, ter- uh, and terrorism with uh, punishments up to life in prison. And activists say it erodes freedoms, but China has dismissed this criticism. It has. It has indeed. And uh, before we get into the responses here and what the protesters on the ground have been saying, Hong Kong is under the one country, two systems policy. Uh, This happened when Hong Kong was handed over from being a British colony to Chinese rule back in 1997. And the policy means that while Hong Kong is technically part of China, it maintains a high level of autonomy. It has its own governing and economic system that are separate from those of mainland China. This semi-autonomy is granted by China's central government. Now, critics of this and those protesting in Hong Kong say that this high level of autonomy is being eroded, is being threatened by this new national security law, that this compromises the democracy in the region and that it, uh, in fact, compromises the rights of Hong Kongers who've grown in a different environment, who have or have enjoyed rights that are different from those in the mainland and enjoyed a distinct culture, uh, which is why those protesting in Hong Kong are calling for independence. Uh, Now, China responded to the situation saying that in many Western countries or any country around the world, you draw a line between freedom of speech and national security matters. And they say that this pro-independence separatist movement in Hong Kong, they describe it as an insurgency, uh, and we've had, in fact, violent protests back in 2019. They also cite blatant foreign meddling as one of the reasons to justify the enactment of this law. So responding to criticism saying that it compromises Hong Kong's um, sense of autonomy, they're saying this is a national security matter, Hong Kong's part of China, We have to do what we have to do. On the other hand, the pro-independence movement in Hong Kong say that their rights are being imposed on, that their freedom of speech is being compromised, and they are backed by Western governments, notably the United Kingdom, which has now said that up to 3 million Hong Kong residents will be offered the chance Mm -hmm. to settle in the UK and ultimately apply for citizenship. That's what Prime Minister Boris Johnson said very recently. Yes, the Prime Minister said Hong Kong's freedoms were being violated by this new security law and those affected would be offered a route out of the former uh, UK colony. And about 350,000 UK passport holders and 2.6 million others eligible will be able to go to the UK for five years to stay. And after a further year, they will be able to apply for citizenship. Now, British national overseas uh, passport holders in Hong Kong were actually granted special status back in uh, in the 1980s, but currently have restricted rights and are only entitled to visa-free access to the UK for six months. But now, things are changed. Have changed. Yeah, things are changing. And the reason is because 
Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the Western countries are reacting. We just uh, mm. had a, a recently a statement coming out from the U.S. House of Representatives. They've approved new Hong Kong-related sanctions after Beijing imposed that security law that was condemned by countries around the world. It still has to be approved by the Senate before going to President Trump. Now. What they are arguing is against uh, the laws that have ended the freedom that were previously guaranteed for 50 years, and that was under the Sino-British Joint Declaration, which is signed way back in 1985, saying that uh, uh, it will be a, a, a it will be handed back to China, Hong Kong will, with certain freedoms guaranteed for at least 50 years under the one country, two systems uh, aspect. But sadly, uh, now with new rulings and new laws being passed, uh, that is not going to be guaranteed for the time being. So that's worrying uh, the Western powers. It is indeed. And uh, it is unclear as well what would happen in 50 years when this agreement expires, so to speak. Uh, it is also uh, unclear uh, how these uh, proceedings would go. And in fact, what those violations might be. Uh, in fact, uh, the new law says they're crimes of secession, subversion, terrorism, and collusion with foreign forces, but we still don't have uh, the specific wording as to how this will be enforced. Stay tuned to the Morning Majlis as we discuss more stories shaping the headlines right here on Pulse95. Pulse95. Hello, good morning, Sharjah and the United Arab Emirates. A brand new day, finally Thursday, and it is going to be weekend vibes here in the studios as we are celebrating the launch of Sharjah's first drive-in cinema, and that has opened its doors. The curtain raiser ceremony happened yesterday evening. A couple of people from Pulse95 were down there as... Um, Moviegoers are going to be treated to some fantastic uh, entertainment options, and that took place. Who went there and didn't take me? Oh. Uh oh, dish, dish, uh -oh. dish. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Tell me. Oh, no, I just spilled <laughs> the beans over here, sadly. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, it might have been me, it might have been someone else, you never know. How was their experience? In my experience. How was their experience or your experience, whoever uh, tried it's, it? It's, too, it's still too early to give them a call and check on it. But uh, <laughs> uh, what we can do is we can hear from the director of events. Of, uh, at Arada mm. uh, who have put together uh, and very well in fact when we discussed this they put on the deadline of 1st of July that was during the pandemic situation and the fact that they got it done is incredible so we will be hearing from them just after 9 o'clock but this hour uh, we are talking about big developments you know everyone loves their jobs mm. and uh, job security is, is one thing that is now going to be uh, a key discussion, a key point of discussion in everyone's, uh, um, let's say, gatherings, mm. uh, social distance gatherings, hopefully. But uh, one person has got a job guaranteed till 2036. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that person. Someone that many people love. He can ride bears, let's yeah, say, but yeah. uh, we can talk about that. But uh, lots to discuss and ponder over this morning. Yes, we do. And we're going to continue the discussion about uh, the state of travel. That's something that's on all of our minds, literally. And it's th this news that we're going to share is kind of it will bump a lot of us out. And mm -hmm. uh, now since many flights are opening up continuously here from the UAE, you might just think, oh, I'll just book a flight online. Um, get a COVID-19 test and get going, right? Because that's the new yeah. norm now, getting a COVID-19 test and getting go get going. But that's not the case. Sadly, that won't be the case. There are many restrictions and set, and set of guidelines to go by. And travel for tourism or leisure is not yet permitted from the UAE. Now, what does that mean? We will highlight and go through that uh, in just a few minutes. Plus, we'll talk about the business of cars because one car company is set to become the largest automaker by market value. And we're talking about Tesla. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, and what's going on here is uh, going to be, well, we'll discuss that during the segment. There are many reasons as to why Tesla is emerging as the world's most valuable automaker. We'll talk about how long that should last and other factors influencing it. Plus more stories shaping the headlines and developments from the UAE and around the world. And if you'd like to join the conversation, text us throughout the show at 4215. We'd be more than happy to have you on in our majlis. Stay tuned to Pulse95.
95. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome back to the Morning Majulus, talking the stories that are shaping the headlines. And we've got a pretty big travel theme for today's show as we go over the requirements and necessities needed for those who are intending on uh, on flying. Uh, right, Rania? Yes. Well, now uh, authorities, they're saying that travel for tourism or leisure is not yet permitted from the UAE. Now, what, how does that work? Even though we have flights opening up like continuously, so you must think that, okay, flights are opening up, so we and it's it's considered for tourism, not for repatriation or anything like that. So that means it's fine. Let's just take a COVID-19 test and keep going. But that's not the case. Officials are saying that anyone planning to travel this summer must apply first for a permit from the Federal Authority for Identity and Citizenship and adhere to all safety measures in their destination country. Now, approvals will be granted only based on the risk level of the country and purpose of the journey. Yeah. So the the risk uh, uh, level of the country must be it must not be um, of high risk, and also you must have a purpose. and And those purposes include either if you're planning to travel uh, for study, for medical treatment, a specific mission, diplomacy, or business. Mm. It could also be available for UAE residents who wish to visit their home country if they're outside and return to the Emirates. Now, uh, Dr. Saif al Vahiri, spokesman for the National Emergency Crisis and Disaster Management Authority, also said travelers would need to take a PCR COVID-19 test within 48 hours of leaving the UAE and present a medical certificate to prove they are clear of the virus before boarding. Now, he also said that travelers should also fill in a health status form at the airport or on their airline's website. And he strongly advises everyone against traveling to high-risk countries and said special rep- permission must be sought for those nations. And of course, travelers must take another coronavirus test um, once they are returning to the UAE and they must isolate themselves for two weeks. Unless they're returning from a low risk country, then they must isolate themselves for one week. Yeah, and, and that list hasn't been announced yet, uh, yeah. the low risk category, but exactly. a number yep. of countries such as the United Kingdom have. And it is very likely that we will follow suit as well. But so far, no official announcement has been made, but Emirates Airlines had uh, enabled the option to book flights out of the UAE to 16 destinations in 12 Arab countries, which included Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, Iraq, Tunisia, Morocco, Algeria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Sudan. And had this was after their previously opened travel to Italy, Spain, the US, Canada, and Australia as well, to, uh, and UK, Germany, and France. Now, looking at those cases, of course, there's a, a significant rise in number of cases in those countries as well. Uh, today, Tokyo confirmed more than 100 coronavirus cases. Uh, but we're still waiting to see for that list. But looking at this website, the exit registration thing, they say tr- for treatment because you have to support your reason for travel by mm. issuing your passport, Emirates ID, visa copy and proof that you're going abroad. Treatment it should be a state expense or a copy of the medical committee's approval. Uh, then there should be a scholarship uh, to go for uh, approved by a medical committee as well. Mm-hmm. Outside the country study, a travel no objection letter by the Ministry of Education and Work Mission, as they say. Um, a letter from him, the employer, pr- proving his work or his or her work or training outside the country. Businessmen, they need uh, contracts of commercial property abroad. So there's a lot. Of, it is just goes to show that yeah don't just don't travel and that's uh, yeah. that's only when we're talking about the guidelines of the uae yeah that's not putting in mind what the guidelines of the <coughs> destination country we're going to are right yeah that you complicates know? it so certainly. that complicates it even more like for example if you go to a country that require a mandatory 14-day quarantine whether at a hospital or at home that's mm. another case right mm. so it is becoming really it's it's not what we expected you yeah. know, when they said uh, flights are opening up mm. and all of a sudden we, we read about this um, 
these guidelines and restrictions, it just makes makes it so much harder for us to travel now. It does, uh, but uh, we all are attempting to cope with these difficult circumstances, right. and uh, a lot of people need to travel. And uh, touching on uh, what Abdul Karim has been saying as far as documents required, people also uh, who are traveling should, for instance, be there uh, the passing of a first degree relative. They need to provide a certificate proving that mm. uh, those traveling for leisure must provide uh, documents showing reservations at the particular entertainment destination that they are attempting to go to. And uh, the authorities also stated that, of course, uh, you need a negative COVID-19 test in order to travel. We've touched on that as well. And a proof of international health insurance that is valid for the duration of your trip and for the destination country. Yeah, well, it's so many complications and so many reasons to consider as well. So stay tuned to the Morning Mindsets. There's lots to get through this morning. Up next, we're talking about job security, and this is a conversation for everyone. What if we told you that you've got your job secured for another 16 years you're going to start buying a lot of things i'm pretty <laughs> sure well stay tuned to the morning majlis to find out who the person is who's gone who's got a get job guaranteed for the next 16 years and can continue riding more bears should that be should the need arise stay tuned to pulse 95 the morning majlis talking the stories that are shaping headlines this is, this is Pulse 95. Well, everybody, good morning and welcome back to the Morning Majlis. And in Russia, we had a referendum on changing parts of the Constitution and allowing a provision that would allow President Vladimir Putin, who had already served for some two decades, to remain in power until 2036. This referendum has been overwhelmingly backed by Russian voters and now Putin is set to rule until 2036. Yep, of course, and this is very good news for him. Uh, opposition members have said he is trying to become president for life. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people saying that uh, it is uh, it is a big lie which does not reflect real public opinion in the country in terms of him being re-elected. And uh, we're also seeing that uh, Initially, when when you know when you look at the early polls, and early polls are always a clear indication mm. in terms of what's going on in, a, in, a, in an election. Eighty-seven percent of the ballots had been counted at one point, mm. and during that, you'd expect maybe forty-five or fifty of in favour. Seventy-seven percent of the voters had backed the measures, mm. and the remaining twenty-three uh, percent should hide under a tree <laughs> maybe and speaking of early polls um, yeah. the early results are actually reminiscent of the 2018 presidential election when Putin also uh, won re-election in a landslide with three quarters of ballots cast then as now Putin had the advantages of incumbency plus a let's just say state media that allows for little open debate on domestic politics in a large state sector that encourages employees to cast votes for the status quo. And that just shows you his popularity. Putin's popularity is definitely genuine despite being uh, dented during coronavirus lockdown. But mm -hmm. on the day before the vote, the Russian president appeared actually in a videotape message in front of a stirring new monument to Soviet uh, soldiers uh, that were killed in in, uh, mm. in the war, yeah. uh, World War Two. Well, the opposition uh, to this uh, said that the government had rigged the vote. Now, looking at Russia's constitution prior to this amendment, it had required Putin to step down in 2024 after the end of his current six-year term. In addition to the reset of presidential terms, allowing him to run twice more, the referendum included hundreds of other amendments, including an affirmation of the Russian people's belief in God. It also includes changes designed to strengthen the country's state council. There is a provision as well banning the, relinqu the relinquishing of any Russian territory. Critics say the move aims to solid solidify uh, Moscow's hold on Crimea as well. Now, Putin, who is currently 67, could serve well into his 80s and had previously sidestepped the two-term limit.
by becoming prime minister for one term while Medvedev stepped into the presidency. Even so, Putin was widely seen as maintaining near complete control over Russian affairs behind the scenes during his absence from the post. Yep, of course. And um, on Pulse95 Radio's Instagram account, just before we go into our, new, uh, our sports headlines, um, we had the question saying, what word would you use to cheer someone up today? And for Vladimir Putin, it is certainly re-elected. <laughs> well, stay with us on The Morning Majlis. Let us know what word you would choose to cheer someone up today as we continue the discussions right here on The Morning Majlis. And you can also join us live on our transmission and broadcast on our Pulse95 Radio YouTube accounts and look at our very, very tired morning faces and very grumpy. But uh, we shall cheer you up, hopefully. We're not grumpy. Maybe it's just me. Never know. No, Sports no. face is on. <laughs> it is the sporting headlines, courtesy of Iman Al Majali. It's the morning majlis. It's the morning majlis. Hello and welcome back to the morning majlis. And we are talking about all things automobiles. And in particular, we're going to talk about Tesla versus Toyota. Let's start with Tesla. In just 10 years, Tesla has gone from public market newbie to the most valuable automaker in the world by market value. Now, the electric automaker had long since passed the valuations of Ford and General Motors and in January became the most valuable U.S. automaker ever when its market cap hit $81 billion. Now, until today, Tesla uh, shares popped just yesterday, maybe, after the market opened, rising nearly 4%. All right, hitting a new 52-week high. That means the company's market capitalization now stands at nearly $208 billion, which means it has surpassed Toyota to become the world's most valuable automaker by market value. Yeah, and experts uh, looking into this say a different number of factors appear to have fueled Tesla's rapid climb since March. They said that its uh, massive Fremont, California auto plant reopened in mid-May sooner than what many had expected. Uh, they also attribute the rise of Tesla to the help of massive fiscal stimulus actions by the United States government, as well as interventions by the United States Central Bank as well, and that their bottom line has held up pretty well over the last few months compared to other automakers. Another big part of this is the fact that the Model 3 production has ramped up at Tesla's Shanghai Giga factory, and Tesla has been seeing strong demand for its vehicles in China, which is being attributed uh, to this massive surge in Tesla. Yeah, well, one point to note is that Tesla's got the... Uh, it's regarded as the most valuable car maker based on its share value. Uh, in terms of sales, Toyota still is quite large. It's been flexing its muscles for a number of decades. Toyota sold around 30 times more cars last year and its revenues were more than 10 times higher than that of Tesla. Uh, but Toyota, of course, it's no longer, in terms of its total stock value, it's $4 billion behind Tesla. So Tesla still, uh, well, Tesla has managed to overtake Toyota in terms of its value, in terms of its strength as a company. But sales, Toyota still has, a, uh, uh, has pretty um, uh, impressive stats. But uh, mm. that it's going to continue for quite some time, I think. Yeah, it's uh, pretty incredible what Tesla is doing because right now, looking at the automobile industry, the pandemic has had a pretty sizable impact as far as production and demand of vehicles. And Tesla's stock is doing so well right now. Its shares are now above $1,100, which when you compare it to its March 19 low of $358, we're up almost 200%. Mm. Uh, in the stock so it's been climbing rapidly at a time where automobile companies just are not thriving at all mm. 
Well, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, the market uh, fares because there's a number of people who are still on the lookout for new vehicles, and that is our very own Rania yes. as well, so <laughs> on the hunt for a new uh, a new car, and uh, oh, yeah. brings back the memories of when I was looking for the uh, the gre- morning majlis green mobile. So. Actually, I did look for a Tesla as well because oh, a lot of people are saying now the new trend is electric cars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Go for an electric car. That is the new face of automobiles. That is where we're going to head. That's where the demand is. So I have a question for Ahmed. Uh-oh. Why did you choose a Tesla? Well, as the owner of a Tesla, <laughs> uh, I would say I-, I like electric vehicles. I think they're fun. They're practical. And they're very responsive, too. Yeah. They have a good feel to them. And they, I feel that the biggest thing for me when it comes to electric vehicles is the fact that they reduce emissions. Of course. So I'm doing my part here to fight climate change and pollution. That's good. I would say those are the biggest uh, reasons uh, as to why I would pursue an electric vehicle. Which model is your favorite? No. I don't. What, you, what, which one you own? I'm, I'm rocking the Model S. Oh, Tesla Model S. Oh, the good one. Yes. Yeah, that's the good one. Expensive one as well. Mm. Uh. Well, I'm a big fan of Model T, if people remember what Model T was. <laughs> the first car in the world, uh, to an extent, Ford's Model T was uh, it was a brilliant, and if I were to own it, I'd be very, very delighted. You can definitely check it out at Sharjah Classic Cars Museum. Uh, if you were to visit the Emirates, because we will be talking about Sharjah's sustainable tourism at some point today, but up next, we are going to be shifting our focus towards the nation's capital, Abu Dhabi. There's a new name for a coastal area and then after that we shall be celebrating Sharjah's first drive-in cinema and uh, what's going to be happening later on in the program. Well stay with us, we shall be returning very shortly after some musical entertainment. It's the Morning Majulus. It's the Morning Majulus. Staycations, drives. Hopefully, when things open up, if you go to a new place, there's going to be well, in fact, there is going to be a place that a lot of people went out for their boat trips, and now it's going to be renamed Coastal Area of uh, uh, of Abu Dhabi, past the um, the let's say the uh, ICAD zone, the industrial zone. You go up uh, towards the islands of uh, Al Ariam Island. Past that. It's between Erwais and Musafah. Yes. Yeah, Al Dabiya. Yeah, so that's been changed now, isn't it? So Al Dabiya now has been changed. The name Mm -hmm. has been changed to or renamed Al Nuf. And this decision was made by Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi and Deputy Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, to quote, ingrain local heritage in the names of regions and Cities. Now, the change aims also to highlight the historical importance of the area. Abu Dhabi, that is according to Abu Dhabi government media office. El Nof is a traditional um, Arabic name meaning elevation and height. And it was chosen to reflect the importance of the area as a center for heritage and also a distinguished tourist destination. Yeah, a lot of offerings here at Anof Island. Now, the name Anof, it's a traditional Arabic name. It means elevation and height and reflects the area as a prime destination for everything from fishing, diving and sail racing as well. And Abu Dhabi is known for its beautiful islands. So uh, there you have it, Anof, highlighting the historical importance of the area and a great spot for fishing, diving and sailing as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the maps and I'm getting lost at the moment because there's so many islands. You love yeah. your road trips, oh, don't you? I love you? my road trips. And, I, and I've, <laughs> I've actually been thinking and looking at this coastal area because I've been to uh, Jabal al uh-huh. I've been to Dalma Island. Yeah. Uh, I've, be, I've not been to Serbanias Island yet, uh, but uh, that is one place that I do want to go. But I'm looking at these different random islands that like, loads of people would like to call them as. Um and you can actually take a boat and go around and check them out really and there's some that are accessible by car uh and i'm just zooming in to see what else is on offer now it's really far i'm penciling in my road Mm. trip plans however (laughs) i will need a covid19 test to be done recently and it should be valid or the results should be within two days within two days 
that I can go and plan my road trip and go over to these wonderful locations that the uh, the nation's capital uh, hosts. Um, but yeah, so far it's I'm just penciling in these uh, these locations, even though they'd be much better during the winter months. Uh, but um, so you can dive in Al Baia. Yes, you can. And it's a, there's a beach you can dive and you can camp there as well. I heard. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, so many locations to check out in nation in the nation's capital, but uh, during the summer months they tend to be slightly um, worrisome for a lot of people. But now the fact that you can't travel abroad is going to encourage a lot of other people to explore the wonders that the United Arab Absolutely. Emirates has to offer. And for all those road trippers who are still thinking of where to go. Look no further than my self-proclaimed birthplace and birth town. Khorfakan. Khorfakan, yes. of course. The Creek of <laughs> Two Jaws. It is somewhere that you can explore. Quiet town, somewhere you can relax and uh, sit by the beach. Now that the Khorfakan Beach Corniche has opened up, uh, and hopefully more restaurants will be opening up soon, uh, it, it is actually quite a pleasant walk if you were to go down there. But yeah, try to go down there in the evenings, late late afternoons slash evenings. Yeah. And just soak in the atmosphere. I enjoyed Jabal Hafid, the road trip yeah. there. Yeah. Still can't go there. That's that's uh, yeah part of yeah. Abu Dhabi, unfortunately. Yeah, that is uh, Ahmed Dawood's hometown as well. Right, yeah. absolutely. Jebel Jace. Well, yeah, so it's also much, nice. Also nice. So much to look forward to. If you've got any particular destinations that you frequented and those unique hideouts that you would like to highlight, then do get involved on the text lines four two one five. If you're not sure what to do, Sharjah's Drive-In Cinema has opened up. It opened yesterday, and we'll be delving more into that right after the news headlines. So stay tuned to Pulse ninety five and have your say on the text lines four two. One five. You're listening to Pulse ninety five. Hello, great morning, and welcome back on to the morning majlis. This is Rania Saadi with Abdul Karim Hanif and Ahmed Dawood, and we have so much to highlight, especially when we're talking about our beloved Emirate of Sharjah. We have so much coming out from Sharjah to discuss, especially today and this hour. We will dedicate it mainly for the newest developments coming out from our Emirates. Now to start. For movie lovers out there, we have great, great news. We have the first free drive-in cinema that just opened in our Emirates of Sharjah just yesterday. And this unique experience will be under the name uh, of Movie Nights at Al Jada. To tell us more about the turnout on the first day, schedule and types of movies being showcased and the measures that are to be taken um, when going there is Ray Tinston, Director of Events at Arada. And that conversation is going to be in just a few minutes, so stay tuned. Yeah, that's coming up next, certainly. Uh, that is something to look forward to. Apart from that, we will also be talking about how the world is going to be faring with the climate change being a concern because the United Kingdom could see temperatures uh, rising above 40 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Another key top topic I'm looking forward to uh, discussing is the, the great uh, and mighty Toonami, Newcastle United, oh. uh, registering a 4-1 victory and they've climbed uh, the ranking slightly. Still a typo there. They should be in the top four anyway. I think it's just <laughs> uh, the news websites don't see it properly. Oh, but uh, it. But yeah, so much to look forward to. Newcastle's fine victory yesterday evening and uh, lots more to discuss uh, this early in the morning. That's right. Uh, we have a number of other developments here. Sharjah Tourism. What is Shuruq up to? How can we advance the sustainable tourism agenda in Sharjah? And most importantly, what leisure destinations should you look forward to in the Emirate? Stay tuned as we discuss all of those stories and so much more on the Morning Majlis. Pulse 95. Between local lines. Notes from the Emirate. Notes from the Emirates. It is. Uh, we are back again. And finally, we've got our movie nights uh, lined up here in the Emirate of Sharjah. Yesterday was the first day of the filming. On Friday, I'm looking forward to the song called You've Got a Friend in Me. And do you remember that song, guys? No. No? Mm. <laughs> From a Toy Story. And oh, it classic. Is, oh. Yeah, yes. It's going to be something to look forward They're to. They're showcasing. Yes, they yeah. are Toy on Story. Friday. Mm -hmm. Well... Drive-in cinema, Sharjah's very first drive-in cinema has opened its car park. 
You could say doors, but it's a car park. It's and, a car park. Uh, we are ready for this attraction and so excited. Cinema Park. Cinema Park, yes. So let's invite Ray Tinston, who is the Director of Events at Arada, for talking to us all about it. Very good morning to you. Good morning. Well, we're exciting. Uh, we're excited to hear about the launch yesterday evening. We've got to ask you because you've done your team has done a lot of work. We finally got the cinema up and running. How was the first night? Uh, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, we uh, we launched the first night with uh, the Avengers. Mm-hmm. Um, our attendance was at capacity. Uh, we have spaces for around a hundred cars. Wow! Uh, and uh, we we filled up quite quickly. Um, and uh, we're extremely happy with with the turnout. And um, Mr. Ray, what movies are being showcased, and and how can we attain the schedule of the show timings? And I mean, where, where can we find them? Yeah, so if you go on to aljadamovies.com, mm. uh, you'd be able to see the the schedule. So, for example, tonight we have Crazy Rich Asian. Uh, Friday night we have Toy Story One. Uh, Saturday night we have Black Panther, and on Sunday night. We have our first Arabic film, but we're going to see that as a surprise for you, mm. uh, and it will be posted live on aldadamovies.com. And uh, Ray, I got a question for you. Could you talk about the concept of the drive-in cinema? What role it would play for the community here, especially during this time? Sure. So, so the idea for the drive-in cinema was uh, a way for us to give back to the community safely. Um, so, the way we position the cars. Uh, in the parking spaces means that even the cars are social distance um, we make sure that people uh, can order their food from their car so if you uh, if you aim your camera at the, the number board that's in front of your car it contains a, a, a link that will take straight to the aljardinmovies.com page um, and you can select your food from your favorite food vendor uh, which is then delivered to your car and the process um, of booking, do you book ahead or is it a first come first serve basis? It's first come first serve. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to uh, to, ha- to have a space at the cinema, uh, and the best way to do that is that those that arrive first um, mm. obtain the best position. Mm. Ray, I've got this question. Uh, back in school days as well, we used to have the shortest people in the front, the tallest at the back. Um, <laughs> uh, have, we, have we got the same feature with the uh, with the four by fours at the uh, the first row, and then uh, the smaller cars are up front? It's a great question. Yeah, correct. So, so we have the smaller cars up front um, and the four by fours at the back, but we're aware that that in in practice is probably not always going to be perfect. Mm. So. Mm-hmm. We, we built a stage so that we've elevated the screen. Mm-hmm. So if, for example, somebody comes along with a, with a great big 4x4, four four, <laughs> um, it won't hamper your viewing experience. And because of the way we've angled the cars, nobody can be positioned in front of you. Oh, that's amazing. And are you, let's, I'm curious to know, are you testing the waters at this point with this free drive-in cinema? Meaning, is this a temporary attraction or this has become permanent? Um, I think it's probably too early to say that it's permanent because um, I, I think post, post this crisis, we would like people to enjoy our community. Mm. Um, but I think it's important for us to start somewhere um, and then we can experiment together to make sure that we are building, rebuilding our community together. Mm. And that's really the point of doing this. Mm. And in terms of uh, the popularity of this attraction, how do you see that uh, developing moving forward? Well, on, on our opening night, we had queues all the way into the development, so wow. into Aljada. So I, I think, you know, it bodes well. Um, Aljada um, uh, has attracted over 130,000 people since we launched at the end of February. Um, so, you, you know, we started out with, uh, with weekends, um, and we, we've had uh, visitors come from as far afield as Dubai, Ajman, Ras um, and it's becoming a, a must-attend destination. So whatever we've put up today, we've been very lucky to have had the support of the community. But it's not just Sharjah, you know. It feels like the uh, uh, Emiratis from other Emirates have, have come to see. Um, and it's becoming a, a destination of choice, and we're very fortunate. No, it certainly is something to look forward to now. 
A lot of parents might be listening to us thinking, oh, that's another great uh, thing to keep our children busy with. Now, one question comes to them, or would come to their mind, is safety measures. Mm. And uh, for us as well, if we're allowing free entry and the first come, first serve, how many people will be allowed in each car and uh, what safety measures are in place? Right, so we have um, security on site to usher each of the cars in. Um, but the, we, we're following government guidelines. Uh, the government guidelines are uh, three people per car uh, with face masks, um, and but but that's not practical for families. So if, uh, if it was a, a single family with the parents of the children, um, that that meets with government guidelines. Uh, we don't allow people to exit the car um, if they needed to take a comfort break. Then uh, we can usher them over to our facility. Uh, but we we encourage people not to leave their vehicles, and we observed last night that people are following the rules. I think we're all aware of um, the seriousness of what's happening. Mm. So uh, people are sort of self-regulating, which is great. Mm, well, it certainly is something to look forward to, and it's great to see that we're all acting in a responsible manner. Ray, thank you very much for joining us this morning, and we wish you all the best uh, for uh, the movie nights ahead. Tomorrow's going to be a busy night with Toy Story. Yeah, yeah, uh, so, uh, so, yeah we, we look forward to welcoming you there as well. Well, we certainly will be. We're going to pencil this into our mm-hmm. diaries. Thank you once again for joining us. You're listening to Pulse95. This is The Morning Majlis. It's The Morning Majlis. It's The Morning Majlis. Hey, everybody, good morning and welcome back to The Morning Majlis. Talking climate change this morning as sweltering temperatures of up to 40 Celsius could be a regular occurrence in the UK. That's what the Met Office and experts say would happen by the year 2100 if carbon emissions continue to stay very high. The current record temperature in the United Kingdom is set at 38.7 Celsius, and this was set in Cambridge last July. This new study says there's an increasing likelihood of going beyond this figure because of the human influence on the climate. Yep, of course, and uh, usually it is uh, in the southern parts of uh, the country. The north would still be okay because the north only knows grey clouds and some rain, and that's what it is. But yeah, it's fine uh, in terms of what's going on. Uh, But at the moment, uh, the heat wave... uh, uh, of around of 2018 which we which we faced uh, a couple of years ago could be 30 times more likely uh, and it's because of the usage of energy transport and all other carbon that has been produced making this heat wave to be 30 times more stronger but now right now the chances of any part of the uk hitting 40 degrees celsius remain extremely low it could occur once every 100 to 350 years. And um, during the heat wave, we saw fires emerging in, in, in the greens and in, in the outskirts as well. So it is going to be very worrisome in terms of uh, how uh, the chances of hitting the high mark are rapidly accelerating uh, every 3.5 years. Yes, absolutely, Abdul Karim. And when it comes to tackling climate change, the experts say that the goal of achieving net zero greenhouse emissions should be placed at the fore, even above business and corporate interests. And they say governments around the world should be imposing that. Uh, They said that investing in climate solutions, in resilient, clean energy economy, and transforming manufacturing to clean energy and zero emission technologies should be a priority. And in fact, very recently, House Democrats have put in the United States have put the most detailed climate change plan in U.S. political history. So that conversation is taking place all around the world, uh, not just in Europe. Not just in Europe, but, you know, people living in the United Arab Emirates would be thinking, oh, 40 degrees Celsius, that's like an everyday scenario for us during the summer. Mm. We can can manage it, you guys can manage it. Uh, No, the situation is in the U.K., it's not humid. It's humidity you can find in, in this part of the world during summer. And it's very dry. And even when it hits 30, what, 28 to 29, it is extremely hot mm. in, in, in the UK. It's very, it, you, you start sweating. And so mm-hmm. there's very dry conditions. And the fact is that not everywhere has air conditioning 
90% places don't have air conditioning. Uh, and so it, it gets really worrisome when, you, when you're out and about. And even in your own homes, you have to uh, open the windows and uh, wasps and bees could fly in as well. So that's another uh, point to be concerned about. But yeah, to, for it to touch 40 degrees Celsius in the United Kingdom, it is, is going to be very, very, uh, a very, very concerning as well. But uh, it's all down to us how we play our part in making sure that the environment remains clean and sustainable. And speaking of sustainable, we're getting and moving on to sustainable tourism of Sharjah. That's what we'll be talking about next. So stay with us here on the Morning Match List. Lots to get through and we'll continue the discussions about sustainability right here on Pulse95. Pulse95. 95. Between local lines. Notes from the Emirate. Staycation vibes in uh, the United Arab Emirates. The reason why we're talking about staycations is because there is a new method of willing to travel abroad. You are meant to fill an online form. You have to uh, completely state your intended uh, uh, purpose of visit. So when it comes to tourism and leisure, things are still under a bit of a question mark whether that's going to be approved or not because you can fly back to your home country. You still need to give justification. You still need to apply for an exit registration on the ICA website. So you can't just rock up to the airport, book your flight last minute and think, Let's have a last minute holiday. Now, staycation is going to be the only option for you for the time being if you would like uh, to stay in uh, hotels in this country. Rania Saadi, a couple of options here in the Emirate of Sharjah, particularly mm. when it comes to sustainable tourism uh, offerings. Uh, Sharuk has been looking at uh, finding a new solutions for it. Rania, if you were to be our travel advisor this morning, what would you say? Well, Al Faya Retreat actually accommodates mm. various areas with different space functions. Now, in the first building are five rooms along with a library, dining room and reception hall. An additional building houses a spa consisting of herbal and Himalayan salt rooms and also an outdoor saltwater pool. And across the road is a cafe featuring locally sourced uh, products um, and of course it has a blend of, of history culture heritage leisure and luxury it's, it's amazing another retreat is also very popular here is the um, Kingfisher retreat is another jewel in the Sharjah collection by Misk which opens the gateway to a unique world of, con- of conservation and um, it's 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 a boutique nature retreat. It's one of the UAE's most diverse ecosystem um, in, in Kalba, and it's twenty. Uh, exceptionally designed luxurious tents are set up approximately 30 meters away from the shoreline to avoid deep dewatering and also raised from the ground by almost one meter to preserve the flora and fauna. So Al Fire Retreat is one. Another one is uh, the Kingfisher Retreat. And it's a beautiful tent. It's outdoorsy. It yeah. feels amazing. And uh, certainly but there's a sea turtle rehab center. The sea turtle rehab center. That's one of the most important things. That's going to be at the Kingfisher <laughs> Retreat. So if you're a fan of sea turtles like we are on the Majlis, uh, be sure to check that out. Uh, there's also the Shedi El Beit uh, that is set to be another attractive destination here. According to Shuruq, it's the far- first five-star luxury and heritage hotel developed by them. It was named the UAE's most luxurious hotel in the year 2019, and it celebrates local aesthetic and heritage. It's got this traditional Arab ambiance combined with modern luxury as well. Yep, of course, and it is uh, coming at... uh a decent price if you go up online and look up you can definitely get a room for just above 500 dirhams at the at the Shadi Al Bayt and uh, it is a, a great location because it's part of the historical neighborhood over there uh, Sukhah Shanasiya and all these are very very uh, uh, lively markets is what you can experience and if you were to look for a retreat elsewhere uh, and go to other parts of course there's the Al-Badair Oasis which is a very new destination that has recently opened up in uh, in Margham area um, uh, very close to Al-Madam uh, it is 
incredible to see what Sharjah has to offer in terms of glamping experience, as His Excellency Marwan Jassim Sarkar, the Executive Chairman of Sharuk, had told us that that's the focus at the moment. So if you're looking for one of those experiences and uh, would like to explore Sharjah's uh, wonderful offerings, then look no further and try uh, the Emirates' wonderful attractions. And if you'd like to have a visual experience, an immersive experience of trying them out, then Pulse95 Radio, when we are live streaming on our YouTube channel, we play a, l- a number of drone shots of Sharjah's wonderful attractions. Mm-hmm. So we are uh, uh, showcasing and, and highlighting uh, the attractions that this Emirate has to offer. There's, there's so much to learn. And to, to learn more about the Emirate of Sharjah, log on, log on to SoundCloud and visit our Morning Majlis's uh, a podcast page subscribe and share away and uh, we are the Morning Majlis team can be uh, tourism advisors uh, markets analysts <laughs> we can be everything in one page and there is a lot uh, lots to explore yesterday we celebrated Canada Day so we could be foodies as well uh, but on Sunday bright and early we will be also Patriots. yes we will be hearing from the US Consul General because it is America Day on Saturday so we'll be joined by them uh, the consulates to talk about the importance of the United the America Day and uh, there is for us the Morning Majlis team Team, it's time to stretch your arms and uh, go home now. That's right. Uh, thank you all for listening. Hope you have a great weekend. Do stay safe and stay healthy. We'll see you on Sunday. This is Pulse 95.